Right, welcome everyone to another GoDaddy Pro Meetup. My name is Marcus Burnett, and I am on the GoDaddy Pro team. I have a special guest joining us today, Nikki Ong, who is the founder and marketing therapist for Simple Sprout Studio. How are you today, Nikki? I'm doing great. How about you, Marcus? I'm doing wonderful. We, uh, like I was telling you beforehand, got a couple of new puppies, so I am adjusting to <laughs> tiny puppy life. But it's like having a newborn again. In, yeah, in some ways, <laughs> it it is. It's my daughter's responsibility, but when she is at school, uh, it gets to be my responsibility. Yeah. So, I am uh, doing that today. Um, I'm gonna get out of the way in here a second, but uh, before I do, I just wanted to touch on what a great title you have, marketing therapist. Um, can you maybe briefly share? what it is that you do as a marketing therapist? Yeah, absolutely. So my zone of genius is in SEO, copywriting, and blogging. And so I handle all the SEO, all the copywriting, and all the blogging for my clients. And I work one-to-one -one with other agencies and handle all that work for their clients. So when people don't have an in-house SEO or copywriter, I'm the person that they call and have them handle everything for their clients. And about just realized that with, when I have those conversations with clients and when I walk them through, whether it's SEO or copy or just talking about business in general, I feel like a lot of us just need that sort of business therapist, that marketing therapist. And that's what Absolutely. I am to a lot of people. And so that's what I titled myself. That's awesome. I love yeah. that. Um, I'm going to get out of the way and let you do your thing here to talk about SEO accessibility. Um, but before I do, I just wanted to let people know that this is being recorded. Um, so we will have a link to the replay uh, available afterwards. Uh, in case you need to step out early or want to share this with your team afterwards, uh, we'll go ahead and make that available to you when it is ready. Also, for those of you joining us here in the uh, in the chat and watching watching us live, uh, please do go ahead and toss your questions in the chat area. I'm going to be off camera, but I will be hanging out in the chat and I will those questions and we'll have just we'll have a little bit of time at the end, I think, to uh, look through those and, and have uh, some of those answered. So if at any point you have some questions for Nikki throughout, please do leave those in the chat. I'll be watching those and putting those together. So I'm going to go ahead and fade into the background here, Nikki, and I'm going to let you do your thing. So uh, the floor is all yours. Cool. Awesome. Well, thank you, Marcus. And thank you, everybody, for being here today. We're going to talk all about SEO accessibility, which is not, you know, the most exciting thing under the sun. But as you will learn, or as we'll talk about more, it is a necessity. It is even more than a necessity. It's the right thing to do. And so we're going to talk about how to help your clients or yourself and their websites or your website be more accessible for the search engines, for users, and what does that all mean? And so if and when you get a chance, what I would love to know is whether you know what accessibility is, if you have any experience in it, and if you're just here to learn a little bit more about how accessibility ties into SEO. So if you guys don't mind popping in the chat, let me know sort of your comfort level with accessibility. I'd love to hear that. And I apologize, my slides were not going full screen. So I'm actually working off a PDF. So I'm just going to scroll up here. And these are this is the slide deck that you're going to get right at the end. So don't feel like you have to you know, be taking furious notes the whole time. You will have access to these slides. So you can just sit back, relax, and enjoy. So I always like to start these off by saying you're in the right place if, because none of us want to spend an hour here if it's not the right place for us, right? So. You're in the right place if you're an entrepreneur. You might be responsible for your own website and you know enough to be dangerous. You're ready to take things to the next level though by being a little bit better with your SEO accessibility. You might also be a web designer, developer, or marketer. You might have your own agency even. And you're creative or you might be a technical person. I'm gonna zoom out just a little bit here because I think it's being covered up. Um, you might have your own company, like I said, but you don't necessarily do SEO and you want your clients to have that strong SEO foundation, which includes accessibility. So we're going to hone in for you on that. And last but not least, you might be an agency owner. So you have a big company, web design, development, marketing, whatever the case may be. And you simply want your, your clients, your customers to have that strong SEO presence, including good accessibility. So if you're any of those three people, you are in the right spot. And today we're going to learn about, number one, 
why is accessibility important? So we're going to start from scratch and talk about what accessibility is and why it's important for you, why it's important for your users. Then we're going to get into design, structural, and developmental accessibility and why good accessibility begins with design, goes through that good structural foundation of a website, and then through development and sort of each piece of the process, how accessibility can play into it. And then last but not least, we're going to talk about on-page optimization. So how does true SEO, you know, when we're talking about SEO, all of this is is essentially SEO, even in design and structure and development, but the true SEO piece as far as keywords, on-page optimization, copywriting, how does accessibility play into that? So we're going to end there. And hopefully you're going to walk away with at least one awesome tip that you can put in place today. That's always my goal. I just want you to walk away with one awesome thing each time. So hello again, I'm Nikki Ong and I'm a marketing therapist. As I said, I say that because it's my mission to help other businesses and especially female entrepreneurs grow their business by making SEO and blogging simple. That is my goal. And ultimately I want you to be found online on Google. So I've been doing this for over 14 years now, which is crazy to me, blows my mind, since 2008. And just a couple of fun facts so we can get to know each other a little bit. Um, first and foremost, I'm a mompreneur. So I stay at home with my three-year-old who is currently napping, may or may not make an appearance. <laughs> Hopefully he naps all the way through, we will see. And I'm also a wife to an awesome husband who is homesick today. So hopefully he can grab my son for me. I'm also from the East Coast. I've spent equal time now living in Maine, Maryland, and now Florida. So I just say I'm from the East Coast because I've lived in all three states for about the same amount of time. I'm a fitness and nutrition enthusiast. I love everything they both entail and just you know feeling good in our bodies so that we can do some awesome work in the world. I'm an author to be. I've been working on a book for a few years and eventually I'll publish it. I'm a red wine lover and an eternal optimist. So hello. It's so nice to be here with you all. I can't wait to learn more about you. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention my business. As Marcus mentioned, um, Simple Sprout Studio is the name of my company. And as I mentioned, SEO does not have to be hard. It is my mission to make SEO and copy and blogging simple. And so I provide simple, proven, and actionable SEO and tactics, content tactics for our white label clients. So I work one-to-one, -one, like I said, primarily uh, with other agencies doing SEO, SEO copywriting, and copy editing, as well as ongoing blogging for clients. But I also have a ton of resources at simplesprout.studio that are free and some courses, <clears throat> excuse me, if you are interested in learning more about SEO and blogging for yourself. So Go ahead and check that out if you are interested. And speaking of, I do have one special freebie for you. So at the very end, I'm going to share um, a link to this freebie that you'll definitely want to stick around for. And it will have everything you need to know about SEO. So now we're diving right on into it. So why is accessibility important? First, what is accessibility? Just to make sure we're all on the same page, regardless of your experience with accessibility and I'm just taking a quick peek. Um, Susan's done quite a bit of research to help website clients. Um, worried about lawsuits, absolutely. Um, what does accessibility mean in this context? Hopefully, Kenman, hopefully I'm, I'm answering that as we go. Um, eager to learn more, awesome. Learn more about accessibility, okay, cool. So you are all in the right place as far as I can tell. So what is accessibility? So we're talking about accessibility for websites and website accessibility is essentially at its core, ensuring every single visitor that comes to your website can use it, navigate it and understand it regardless of their disability, injury or other impairments. So basically we're trying to ensure that our websites give people the best chance and the most equal chance of understanding it, being able to use it, and essentially doing whatever they need to do with it and interacting with it. And it, it just makes sense, right? I mean, and that's kind of what I started with. Accessibility just makes sense. We want everybody to be able to use our websites. We want everybody to be able to come and, and see them. 
So why is it an SEO concern, though, in, in the scheme of search engine optimization, which I'm sure many of you know, but I'll just say for the sake of everyone being on the same page, search engine optimization is everything that we can do on and off our websites to help them rank higher in the search engines like Google. And so why is everyone being able to use the website an SEO concern? It's a huge one. Number one, um, good accessibility improves user experience. So essentially, we're giving users the best experience on our website possible, right? Um, you can quickly find information. And so essentially, we want to allow people to quickly find information as quickly as possible. We want to get them directly to where they need to go as easily as possible without any sort of barrier, any sort of confusion. Additionally, if that's not enough to convince you, Google prefers accessible websites. And so Google is actually starting to rank websites based on their accessibility, as I'm sure with you've, you've seen with things like Core Web Vitals. Google and the other search engines are definitely starting to incorporate more and more and more accessibility within the algorithm. So if your site is not accessible, you're going to lose rankings. And finally, there's the legal implications, as I think Susan had, had mentioned. Um, there have been lawsuits, many, many lawsuits, in fact. As I was doing research for this, I found quite a few of people that were not able to access a website properly. They weren't able to understand it properly. They weren't able to access forms properly or see alt text over images to know what the image was. As we'll talk about that a little later. And so they sued the company because it's it's against good practice to do that. And so, yes, you can absolutely have legal implications. But I will say many of those companies were, you know, big Fortune 500 companies. Typically, people aren't going to come after, you know, smaller websites. But all that being said, it's just it just makes good sense. And to protect yourself legally long term, it absolutely is a good choice. So the good news for you is that good accessibility leads to good usability for your visitors, which leads to good SEO, and it just keeps going round and round and round. So essentially, when you have good accessibility on your website, you're going to have good SEO. And it's nice that they all sort of feed each other, and all you're doing is benefiting your visitors. All you're doing is helping people. So again, it just makes good sense to have a good accessible website. So again, by improving your accessibility, you're benefiting everyone. And so just so we're literally on the same page here about how, who we're talking about, um, because sometimes it's a, it can be a little vague. I'm talking about, when I talk about accessibility, I'm talking about people that have seeing impairments. So they're either blind or seeing impaired partially. Hearing impairments, they might be deaf or partially deaf. Cognitive impair impairments, neurological impairments, physical impairments. You know, they're unable to use a mouse or a keypad in um, a way many of us might be able to. Temporary impairments like an injury, you know, somebody broke their arm and they can't properly use their, their keyboard like they normally can. Situational impairments, like if they have very, very slow Wi-Fi or um, maybe they're on a train doing work, you know, is your website still going to load for them? And environmental impairments, um, are they outside and, and there's a lot of sun on their laptop screen and they're unable to see colors because you don't have enough contrast in your colors, something like that. And so while we can't make everything perfect, for all of these people, and not everybody's going to have the exact same experience on our website. The goal is to get everybody's experience as close as humanly possible. That's the ultimate goal with accessibility. And just to get a little geeky on you, because I think it's necessary in this conversation, but the rest of it, I promise, is going to be a little lighter, a little more fun. The four principles of accessibility. Now, these come directly from the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. Um, which were created by the World Wide Web Consortium, or W3C. Many of you probably know them. You can access, I think it's w3c.org, I want to say, um, but you can access their website. They have a ton of information there, everything you would want to know about accessibility. And the guidelines the WCAG um, basically gives website builders and creators the specific guidelines for better accessibility. In just a little bit, I'm gonna share, and you'll have access to it on the slide deck, I'm gonna share a checklist, not by um, the W3C, but it's through um, a really awesome company. They created a whole checklist for everything that you need to know in order to align with these guidelines. 
it is long, it is tedious. So I'm just, I'm going to say this in the next slide again, but the whole idea with this is to take one step at a time, attempt not to get overwhelmed by all of this. This is my marketing therapy coming through. Don't get overwhelmed by it and just literally take it one step at a time. You can check out that checklist and just slowly go down through everything and make sure that you have everything squared away on your website. What I don't want to have happen is that you step away from today and say, oh my gosh, I have to do all these things to my website. I'm doing everything wrong. I'm going to get sued. I don't want that. I want you to take this one step at a time. And the reality is most platforms and most um, websites are doing okay. Um, so what you can first do, and I'll share this in just a moment as well, is, is check your site and then go down through the checklist and see what you're missing. But for kind of moving back here, I do want you to have the basic fundamentals of sort of what we're talking about. So this, these, again, are the four principles of accessibility. This is what the W3C basically um, has sort of cultivated these guidelines around, that websites should be perceivable, operable, understandable, and robust. It spells out the acronym POOR. And so with perceivable, you're essentially removing any sort of barriers to access your website. So you think screen readers, color contrast, text size control. So people have control over, you know, if like I, I can barely see the screen without my glasses on. So if I'm on a website, I don't have my glasses on, I would love to be able to increase the size of the text so that I can actually read it. Operable, the user interface must be accessible for tools and the user. So think clear navigation on your website. Think keyboard operation. Can you use just a keyboard and do certain things that need to be done on your website? And time allowance. Um, things like when there's a time allotment for a form, are you giving people enough time to fill out the form or is it way too little for the you know an average person to be able to do that, let alone someone with disabilities? Is the website understandable? Are you using easy to understand action and language so that people understand what's happening? So think clear copy and links, clear navigation, predictable and consistent components. You know, is the navigation the same from page to page to page? While you may be thinking, of course, why wouldn't it be? In certain situations, people may have put together websites that lack certain pages, the navigation doesn't match, they're getting a different experience on each page. Obviously, all those offer a very bad user experience and very bad accessibility as a result. Is the site robust? Um, is your website or app accessible across multiple platforms and multiple devices? So does it have clean code? Is it updated regularly so that it's uh, operating properly on all of those devices? And are there clear status messages? So for instance, if you add something to your cart on an e-commerce website, is there a little notification box that pops up that tells you something was added to the cart? Because otherwise, was it? Was it not? It can be a little confusing. And really at the end of the day, especially with being robust, as far as is, is the website accessible across multiple platforms, that is taking into account whether it's accessible on most modern platforms, most modern devices. That doesn't mean that you need to be, you know, your website needs to work on an archaic version of Internet Explorer. Certainly not the case. Um, but in general, it's doing as much as humanly possible on each one of these four principles. Okay. So again, I mentioned I would say this again. At the end of the day, good accessibility means putting the user first. So consider intent and context. At the end of the day, what content are you trying to put out there? What should the user know? What should they understand? And is that clearly defined on your website? And we'll talk about very specific ways to do that momentarily. And again, as a reminder, this does not need to happen overnight. If your website is scoring pretty low in the accessibility realm, take a deep breath, do one thing at a time, it will be okay. All right. So Number two, now we're going to talk about specific things you can do around design, structure of your site, and development as far as accessibility. So first, design. So a lot of these um, probably make sense, right, as far as um, good design. And let me know, raise your hand if there are any um, designers in the house. I would love to know. Um, oh, Lynn posted a, an executive director. Are you an, the executive director? 
or you're posting the oh nice well welcome that's exciting um so um sorry got, got <laughs> mom brain um so design best practices so these are other things from a design standpoint that you need to make sure are squared away on your website for good accessibility. Number one, clear fonts. So like the font I have here, not a great choice for a website. And I will fully admit that because it's hard to read, right? It's a, it's a cursive font. I would not recommend using that for a website. You want to have clear, crisp font um, that, oh, and actually, sorry, this is the wrong wording here. Just ignore that. I will fix that for the slides. Apologies. Basically, what I'm saying is you want to make sure the font is clear, easy to understand, easy to see, is large enough on most screens, and you have the ability to make it larger if and when possible. You also want to make sure that you're using high contrast. So incorporate high contrast colors for fonts and throughout the background and foreground on a website. Things like using a black background with a white font white font can be very difficult to see sometimes, right? So that's why light backgrounds and dark fonts are best. Having high color contrast just in general throughout the website is going to be best for people. Um, and as I was doing research for this, I actually learned that 10% of the population has some version of, um, of color seeing issues is, is colorblind in some way. Isn't that incredible? 10% of our population has trouble seeing colors in the right way. And so when you can't see colors, especially close ones, they all look the same and all the colors look muted. So that's why you want that high contrast. You also wanna make sure that there's more text and less images, ideally. I know that's probably one of the worst things I can say to a designer, but the reality is that screen readers cannot see images and they cannot see video. And so text is really ideal. And you certainly wanna stay away from anything where you have text on an image and that's included in your website. So make sure the text is readable, make sure it's in the code that users can see it easily and that it's readable by those screen readers. And then last but not least, you of course wanna make sure that the site is responsive, that it can fit to the screen of any size. And that those are the, the basic principles for the um, design phase. Now, moving through design and thinking about structurally how the site is set up, how it's organized, you wanna make sure that you're following these best practices. So first and foremost, create a user-friendly navigation structure. It needs to be clear and crisp and easy to understand. And for those of you who may be new to this process, the navigation structure I'm talking about is either like the sitemap of your website or the pages on the site. Typically we'll see the navigation at the top of the website, sometimes on the side, but not so much anymore. And so you wanna make sure that the, there are few only a few options, only a few pages. Typically I say no more than seven to eight pages for main navigation, no more than seven to eight options for like a drop down menu, and then no more than seven to eight for a third drop down menu if you have one. And that's simply for good usability and good accessibility as well, because we don't want to overwhelm people. If you think about it like this, screen readers, the way they work, they'll basically give people the options. They'll read through all of the navigation items. So if you've got 20 navigation items, that's very overwhelming for people to make a choice. So make sure they're few, as few as possible, that they're clear, that you know exactly what you're getting, you know, home, about, shop, services, blog, contact, very crystal clear. This is not a spot to be cutesy and not a spot to use jargon by any means. So make sure they're extra clear. Then you also want clean and clear URLs. They should align with what the page is. And by default, if you're using something like me, I, I love WordPress. We um, have a lot of WordPress sites that I use for clients or something like Squarespace or some of the others. They'll automatically create the URL structure based on the page. So you don't have to worry about it as much, but do make sure that if you're editing them at all, that they're clear, that they match exactly the page that you're talking about. You also can use breadcrumbs when and where possible. So breadcrumbs are essentially links on the page that show the hierarchy, the, the site navigation, as far as where you are. It's also great for SEO and for spy search engine spiders as they crawl and they can essentially understand what page that they're, that they're on and where that falls in the hierarchy and the structure of the website, which is really cool. Like I said, a lot of this is doing double duty for SEO, usability, and accessibility. 
And then last but not least, make sure you have a site map. So that's great for SEO, but it's also great for accessibility so that people can understand that hierarchy, but it's all on one page. It's all in code. It is available for search engines. It's available for screen readers to really understand what's on each and every page. And just as a side note, make sure that you're submitting your sitemaps to Google Search Console to make sure that each and every page on your website is getting indexed, just as a fun side note. And finally, developmental best practices. I'm going to take a quick drink. So these are, again, just like everything else, it makes good sense to incorporate these practices as you're going. So for the developers out there, you want to make sure that you're using semantic HTML, which I'm sure many of you are. So you're clearly defining site elements for both browsers and users. Essentially, semantic HTML, for those of the, you that don't know, is a great language for browsers and users to understand. And there's no, um, there's no complexity with the code, essentially, is what it boils down to. And so it's just good, clean code. You also want to add attributes for tags. So incorporating Tags like for images for great accessible descriptions. So that might be something like your alt tags, which would describe an image. We'll talk about that in just a, a minute. And then you also want to use ARIA roles or elements, which is kind of similar, slightly different. So for other types of page elements to further enhance accessibility and help both browsers and the user ultimately understand what they're looking at. So again, I'm thinking of screen readers when the screen reader hits a button or a list or a video. To be able to tell the user what's happening is crucial for people that, that need it because otherwise it's all gobbledygook. I mean, think, think about if you closed your eyes and had something read an entire website to you, would it make sense or would it be a little bit confusing? Last but, or next to last but not least, structure data and schema. So, this isn't necessarily going to be right for every website, but things especially around like local businesses, um, recipes, um, special types of content and contact pages are the big ones that really need schema markup. So if and when available, include that. And basically this not only enhances SEO and using rich snippets in um, search engine results where you have basically like a, a recipe pop up right at the top. It will help you uh, optimize for that, but it will also help screen readers. And then last but not least, this is what I alluded to before is running accessibility tests. So you've done all these things, right? You've done all this good groundwork, this good foundation for accessibility. Now you want to check it on the other side and make sure it's running properly. So when you get this slide deck, you'll be able to click on these links or you can Google it right now if you'd like. Um, you can use a tool like Site Improve, and there's a ton of these, but this is one that I thought was really easy to use. Site Improve has a free accessibility tool that does a quick check on your uh, website, and it gives you a score. And then if you email them for more information, they'll actually send you a further free report, and it will have a breakdown of what they initially gave you, which is really powerful. And again, there's a lot of other ones that do it as well. And then the checklist that I mentioned by WebAIM, it's very overwhelming. I will tell you that right now. It is, in my mind, best suited for developers just because it, it has more development speak. And so if you're not a developer, but you work with one, you could always send it to them depending on your accessibility uh, score and see kind of what, where you can make improvements. So again, all of these things are really best practices in general. So it works well because it aligns with everything we should be doing and just kind of gives us that little nudge to make sure that we're doing it in the right way. So part three of what we're going to talk about with accessibility is on-page SEO. And so we've got this great foundation now of design and structure and development. And now we're going to build upon that with front-facing content, keywords, and everything that people need essentially when they look at a website and ha have a need for accessibility. So this is what we're going to go over. Page titles, meta descriptions, headers, good readability, using bullets and lists, image alt text, link anchor text, and creating video transcripts. So I'm going to break down each one of those now. So your page title, and I'm going to take a quick peek actually and make sure that, um, oh nice, we have Word, WordPress, website designer, awesome designer, cool. 
Okay. So a lot of designers in the house. So hopefully now as we head into this third section, you guys probably had a good idea then of part two, as far as designing, developing. Now we're going to talk about front end. So what, what you can help your clients do on that front end. Awesome. So page titles, page titles, as I'm sure you're aware of, um, are intricate for SEO. This is the spot where you want your keywords as far as SEO. Page titles are very specific and unique for each page or should be specific and unique for each page. They should include your keywords and they're very much of a phrase-like structure. The other thing that they do is when it comes to accessibility, they describe what the page is about for people that can't see or can't understand in the same way that many of us can. And so not only is it good for SEO, but it's also good for accessibility. So when you assign a title to a page, you, you, it'll show up in a couple of different places. First, you'll see it here as the blue or purple once you click it link on Google. And so as you can understand, that's really important for users. When they're trying to decide which Google um, option to click, that title is the first thing that we look at, right? So it's super important that we have our keywords there and also that it accurately describes the page that it's going to. And that's why it being unique for each and every page on the site is so important. It will also show up at the top of your browser window as well. If you're ever curious, if you're on a page where it's showing up, that's where. And I saw a lot of WordPress in the house. So for you guys, I highly recommend Yoast SEO if you're not using it already or if you're unfamiliar with it. Yoast makes it really, really easy to assign these titles to each and every page on the site. And then secondly is meta description. So that's sort of secondary to titles. The meta description shows up as this black text underneath of the title on a Google search, which is really helpful because it further enhances what the page is about, right? So this one's gonna be more sentence-like. I typically do about two sentences and I often end with a marketing message that might include the client's phone number so that potentially somebody could click right on that phone number and access the company right away. Now, your meta descriptions similarly should include your keywords, certainly for SEO, but they also need to accurately describe and uniquely describe what that page is about. And many times the easiest thing to do is simply choose a sentence or two that accurately describes the page from the copy itself. That's a great way to do it if you're, you know, in a little bit of a rush or you just want to get something up there quickly. Um, choosing a couple of sentences right from the copy is perfectly fine. And actually that's what Google will do if you do not assign a meta description at all. It will pull from the copy itself and assign met a meta description. Next, and this is a biggie, um, is proper heading structures. So for the designers out there, ensuring that you have these set up from at the design level and making sure that headings follow a structure and then that the client follows it. So to make sure that your H1s are always at the top of the page and the H2s follow and then H3s and, and so on and so forth. So by doing a little bit of education, if you're not creating copy for them or you're not kind of coaching them through the copy process, giving them a little bit of education on this and how to properly use headings will be huge, especially for those people with screen readers, because when it hits the heading, it will describe to the person what's happening. And then they can assume that everything under that is the copy that goes along with it. Now, when you start using these interchangeably or you start mixing them up, it can be extremely confusing for people and they're going to leave. And we don't want that. Um, good readability. So this one's interesting as a copywriter because obviously one of my goals is to align the writing with the people that we're talking to. So when you think of your client's audience, if you're doing the writing or your audience, if you are, if it's your website, you really want to ensure that the copy is crisp, clear, and easy to understand. As a basic level, unless it's academia, you really want to stay at like a sixth grade reading level or like an eighth grade reading level at the most, because in general, most of the population understands at that level. And honestly, many of us don't want to be reading academic journals when we go to a website, right? That's a surefire way for us to leave. So unless you're in that space, keep it simple, keep it easy, keep it just effortless to understand. And so you want to avoid jargon or long sentences or write, read, writing, excuse me, at too high of a reading level just to maybe sound smart. Um, 
unless that is your audience, unless that those are the people that you're trying to reach, just avoid it. There's no need. Um, people of any accessibility level will be leaving if it's not a good fit for them. Um, you also want to make sure, as we'll talk about in a little bit, that any sort of calls to action are also easy to understand, that that navigation is using words that are easy to understand. And then lastly, incorporating great formatting, as I mentioned, like bullets and numbered lists are crucial, not only for SEO, but also for accessibility, because what will end up happening, I learned this actually, as I was doing research for this, is when a screen reader reads aloud to someone that's seeing impaired and it hits that numbered list and it's using the correct tags and attributes so that the screen reader understands that it's a list. It will actually tell people like this is a list of five things and then, then it will go down through the five things. So it makes it really easy for people on the other end to understand what's coming at them. They know what to expect, which is super cool. And then I just love good formatting with websites because of the way that people scan them who aren't using screen readers necessarily, um, people scan. So when they hit a numbered list, they're like, wow, I'm about to learn five things, which is great. We give them clear expectations on both ends of the spectrum. Alt, uh, sorry, image alt text or um, alt tag, sometimes these are called. These are crucial. You have to understand that both search engines and screen readers and other accessibility tools do not see images. Um, this technology is coming really far as being able to like start to see certain things I've, I've found through my research, which is really cool, but it's not the same as seeing it, certainly. Um, these things aren't human beings, so we have to help them along a little bit. So using image file names that are clear and as well as alt text every time you upload an image is crucial. This was actually one of the... Um, the uh, legal issues that I saw come up and I forget what company it was for, but I'm sure it's happened more than once where somebody was using their screen reader. The company did not have um, image alt text at all anywhere on the website and they ended up suing them. And I believe they won as a result of that. So make sure any image that you upload has alt text. Also make sure that you're not keyword stuffing, which means including a bunch of keywords that don't apply. Like if I were to write for this image, if you can see that there, like, woman on phone with computer with glasses, blog marketing, female entrepreneur, marketing, marketing expert, you see where I'm going with this. Make sure it's crystal clear to the point. Um, my images for my business, as many of you as web designers and developers, um, I use a lot of computer imagery, a lot of typing. Um, they're not, you know, the most exciting things in the world, but I still have to to go through the process of using that alt text and describing them so that when someone hits that image with their screen reader, they know what's coming up. On the other side of the token, using image alt text and also using um, optimized uh, file names, lost my train of thought, um, image file names will help you with SEO because you can theoretically rank well in image search, which is really cool. So when you're doing Google searches and images pop up, now you have the potential to rank well for those images, which is incredible. Uh, similarly, link anchor text. Now I want to um, actually draw your eye down here and I'm just gonna zoom in for fun a little bit um, down here. So if you're just scanning this quickly and you see click here and that's the link for the free SEO download or if you need more help, download the free ultimate SEO checklist. Very different, right? And imagine, you know, scanning that. Someone with a screen reader, they're going to hit that click here and think, click here for what? I don't, I don't know what I'm getting. Similarly to search engines, search engines see click here and they think, where does this link go? I click here means nothing to me, right? It's just click here for what? So ensure that you're using optimized anchor text, which are the words that you're using within a link and that those accurately describe where the link is going. So get rid of the click here's and learn more's. Although you could use them, like if I linked this entire thing, click here for the free SEO download, that's perfectly fine if I linked the entire sentence. But if I'm only linking click here, that's a big problem. Similarly, you wanna make sure you're doing the same thing with your buttons. I think that we're missing out on this a little bit because button text has to be so short because of it being a button, but you can use attributes to describe the button to help people with screen readers. So it's not just click here, or learn more, whatever the case may be. So use those within the, the development as well. 
And then last but not least, use video transcripts, just like search engines and uh, people who are using screen readers and other technology cannot see images. They also cannot necessarily see videos. And so we need to help them along a little bit. So you can use captions within your videos. So I'm talking anything from like a YouTube upload, Vimeo. Um, I don't recommend, as I'm sure you guys know, to put the video directly on your website. Um, but you can use, you know, caption technology. You can pay someone to... Um, put together the captions for you, and then also put together a video transcript. And this could be as simple as having the transcript on YouTube in the you know description area, having a link that goes to another page underneath your video on your website that says like transcript available. And then people can click over to that and get the whole transcript of the video. And similarly with a transcript, you can either pay a service to do that for you. You can write it out if you really want to, or you can have somebody do it on your behalf. But that's going to be huge as far as videos go and giving people the right accessibility uh, to access them and to, to enjoy them. So here is everything that we talked about. Um, I'm hoping that you got at least one good tidbit out of today that you can put into action right away. So we talked about the importance of, of accessibility and that it doesn't just make sense for usability. It also makes sense for SEO. We talked about some ways to make design, structure, and developmental accessibility doable and easy throughout the process, I hope, because it just makes good sense. And then we talked about on-page SEO accessibility to take proper on-page SEO steps for the right keywords and tags and content so that you can put them into action for yourself or for your clients. So I just want to say thank you so much for being here with me today. Um, you can check out my website at Simple simplesprout.studio for freebies and downloads and some coursework on SEO and blogging, as well as follow me on any of the um, major social media. I'm at Simple Sprout Studio, all one word on all of them for the most part, except for Twitter. Um, I have an underscore after because I couldn't grab it. Um, and I did not forget the freebie. And I'm also going to do questions in just a moment, but I wanted to share this with you before I forgot in case anybody needs to hop off. I think we're, we have a good bit of time for questions. Um, but I want to offer you, this is my most popular freebie and it's super helpful because I use it myself for my clients. It's the exact checklist that I use for everyone when I do SEO. So if you're, if you want to DIY your SEO or you want to DIY it for your client, check this out at nikkiong.com forward slash simple sprout forward slash checklist and you can download the checklist it will give you literally everything you need to know about seo and you can just check 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 down the list which is awesome and then i'm gonna pop over here i'll leave that up for you guys um oh you know what i'm going to grab the because i don't have it because i'm using those slides i'm going to grab the link to the slides so that you have them. And I'm gonna go back in and fix that one. Oops, so let me go back. There we go. I'm gonna put the, um, the link, actually I'll put both links. So I'll put the link for the free checklist in the chat. And then, yay, love Yoast, awesome. I love Yoast too, Susan. Um, okay, so that is the free checklist. And then I'm going to put in the link to the slides so you guys can grab that. Every time you come on, you bring these beautiful slides, and then I start to listen, and there's so much good information in hey. all of and all of these slides and all of the, you know, information that you bring for each of the sections and stuff. Um, Thank you. I know that you tackled some of the questions along the way. I also have a handful of questions that were, um, that were sent in to me beforehand. So I'd like to run through a few of those. And yeah. uh, as folks in the, in the chat here have any other questions, please do feel free to continue to add those in. We'll keep an eye on the chat as well. Um, the first one that I have is, so how does SEO accessibility factor into building websites? Like, is that the responsibility of the developers, the content writers, mm -hmm. the, the agency or the clients who, 
who should be thinking about it and who should be actually putting it into into practice? Yeah. Um, wow, that's a good question. I would say everyone. Um, I think it's everyone's yeah. responsibility. I think that, and that's why I kind of created it like this because in general, I mean, the people I work with tend to be like, a, des a designer or a developer or an SEO person, right? So I think at each one of these stages that I sort of talked through, I think each person needs to be responsible for their part of it. So like the designer needs to be responsible for obviously like coloring and the right font choices and um, ensuring there's a responsive attribute happening as well as the developer make sure that all that comes to fruition as the website's being built um, that the seo person and the content writer is making sure that everything looks good on the front end as well so i think it's everyone's responsibility and then perhaps like if you have a project manager for instance like they're doing maybe running the checks and ensuring that everything looks good sort of overall um but it, it's a challenge right because many of these things can fall through the cracks very very easily um, and so I think that, you know, we all sort of have to look out for each other in a way and, and make sure that everybody is doing their due diligence to make things accessible as possible. Yeah, I, I agree 100%. I think yeah. there's so many different aspects to making sites accessible that it really can't just fall on, you know, one party or one department or whatever it has to be kind of an all, all hands effort. Um, sort of related, if a client isn't as informed, obviously everyone that's attending here is here for a reason. They want to learn more about accessibility, yeah. becoming informed. If a client, however, isn't as informed, how do I convince a client that this is important and worth paying for? Because mm. it, yeah. it has to it has to factor in somehow. It's still time sure. that's that's being used that has to be part of the, you know, part of the project. Yeah. Um, I would say it depends on the person, right? As far as like what's going to move them to to invest or to make the choice. I, I would say I hope that from the few things that I talked about right at the beginning, um, as far as it making good SEO sense, it making good sense for users, um, the big list of people that it affects. Um, I, th I thought the statistics... Um, the only one that stayed with me was the um, color blindness that 10% of our population has some spectrum of color blindness. I thought that was just yeah. incredible. Um, I, I might hit them with some other statistics, you know, as far as I, I'm not quite sure the numbers as far as like how much, how much of our population is blind or deaf or some level of either or has a disability in some way, you know, I'm not sure those numbers. So maybe hit them with that and say, when someone sees this, website or or literally doesn't see it and they're using a screen reader it's very difficult for them to see and you're missing out on helping those people um i, I think ultimately business owners want to help their people they don't want to lose out on any potential audiences so i i would hope mm -hmm. that would convince them enough if they still say no they might not be your person <laughs> ultimately oh, that's fair <laughs> so yeah yeah, that's definitely fair. I, I that ten percent stood out to me when you were talking about it yeah. too. Um, it doesn't sound like a high number, but if you think about a site that gets a relatively meager like thousand visits a month, that's a hundred visits where somebody had some sort of like colorblind or potentially had some sort of colorblind issue with the site yeah. and wasn't able to use it as you might have intended it to be used. Right. Um, and then just sort of talking about like convincing clients that it's important i feel like it always comes back to these buckets for me there's like there's the ethical bucket where you just want to do right by people you want to make sure that it's you know that everyone can enjoy the the best you know the best possible across the board mm -hmm. then you have the then you have the business bucket where of course once you do this especially in terms of seo you get more traffic you get more business yeah. more sales you know whatever it, the case it is it just makes sense yeah and then you have that legal bucket, like Susan was talking about at the top in the chat, yeah. where you don't want to get sued. And if that's not a strong enough argument, I don't know what is. Exactly. But that's sort of like, maybe even in that order is sort of the buckets that you want to fall through, right? You have the ethical bucket, the business bucket, mm -hmm. and at the worst case, you just don't want to get sued. So you have that kind of fallback. Yeah. I think that those are worth thinking through. Um, Susan, Susan asked in the chat, um, like logistically, how do I make my WordPress nav bar accessible with the tab key? Do you have any um, tips there? I do not totally transparent. I'm going to stay in my lane here. <laughs> I am not a developer. 
Um, I work with amazing developers who know the answer to that. So I would look it up or, um, you know, seek help from a, a fellow uh, developer. I do not know the answer to that, unfortunately. Yeah. And, and I'll follow up with just a shallow answer. And that is that if you use WordPress's built-in navigation menus, for the most part, those are accessible. It's when you start adding in plugins that create these like mega mm -hmm. menus and stuff that I think you might start to get into trouble. So, nice. you know, look at look at the plugins that you're using to create the menus for your site. Talk to the developers of those plugins or just, you know, try to tab through and see how they work as well. One of the things that I haven't done a ton of, but I know um, it's always helpful is if you can throw a screen reader on and just surf around the web and see how that behaves, what it does, how you have to sort of in navigate around um, using a screen reader and get a feel for what folks who do use screen readers all the time, you know, have to contend with. And so when you run into things like navigation, not quite working the way you'd expect it to, then, you know, that's something that you need to look into. Yeah. And then I just saw, um, and that's, I, I do, one of the reasons, many reasons I love WordPress is is just for that, is that at its core, at the foundation of WordPress, it's very accessible. And they, a lot of these platforms are doing their due diligence to make sure they're accessible. They would be silly not to. Right. Um, and then, so Susan asked if, um, yeah, you don't, I get that. You don't want to guarantee your promise that the website will be accessible, but that it's the best to your ability. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think that's all you can do. I, I don't think that it's a problem to use sort of vague language around that, that like basically you make it as accessible as humanly possible, that it that you're aware of it, that you're doing your due diligence. And then you can always run it through one of these tools once you're ready to launch, I think, and just check, you know, go through the checks, make sure that, you know, these um, you're hitting all the main areas. Um, it will tell you what's a problem and then you can simply fix it. Um, I think would be your your best bet. Yeah, great communication is always going to win out there as long as you're open to having conversations about accessibility, right? You're not making promises other than you're doing your best. And so if something comes up that you need to look at, then having you know an open mind and an open dialogue to be able to tackle those issues together, I think is going to win the day there. Absolutely. And I've had a few clients who know, um, one in particular that I'm thinking of was a nonprofit and they served um, a lot of um, parents with children with disabilities. And so they were very sensitive to ensuring that the website was as accessible as possible. And they had very clear um, expectations of what they wanted. Like they wanted the, the text change sizing to be extra clear right there at the top, take up a lot of real estate. Um, and so I agree with Marcus, just having that dialogue as far as, especially if the client is one that is extremely sensitive to better accessibility, what are the specifics that they want to see? So then you can design around that as well. Yeah, that actually segues great into one of the other questions that I had ahead of time was, um, as a designer, we had a section there talking about design and stuff, and a lot of it is about you know keeping it simple, keeping it clear. How do you balance creativity and accessibility? You don't want to strip necessarily all creativity out, yeah. but you don't want to over-design it in a way. Um, some of the things that you pointed out, right, not being too cutesy in the navigation, having mm -hmm. simple menus, um, not including text and photos if you don't have to. Right. How do you how do you kind of balance being able to do some creative things still. Yeah. Um, great question. I, I think that it, I think that simple design is what people like now, right? I mean, just clear, crisp, clean is what I'm seeing a lot. I imagine what a lot of the developers or a lot of the designers here are designing. And if anything, I would say it kind of pushes you out of your creative comfort zone to be extra creative to still have those unique design elements, um, but not go overboard. And I, I think going overboard is something as far as thinking of archaic websites where they did have a lot of images that had text within the image, or there, it was just so image heavy that it was overwhelming to the text. Um, I think if you don't overthink it as far as you know, getting overwhelmed by the accessibility conversation and simply design what feels natural, what feels good. And just ultimately what is simple, I think that you'll always win out. Um, 
I think oh, if you're if you're over designing, then it would be a question. But modern day design, I don't think you're going to have a problem at all. Yeah, I I really love actually the connection between accessibility and SEO because I don't think mm -hmm. it's thought about all that often nope. but i think that there is a real driver there it's just thinking back to kind of when i used to design sites at the agency that i worked at but like early in my career there wasn't really a web font like option you, you had four six different fonts that you could use and so the way that you would make really you know fun looking you know, font like type on the internet is that you would put it in an image and then you would make that image a header and it was awful and it was awful for SEO and it was awful for accessibility. And I think that you have that like SEO driver that to start with that got changed because it impacted SEO, mm -hmm. having all of your headers inside of images did absolutely nothing for page ranking. Right. And so SEO is kind of this driver, but it's so closely tied in that that's also, you know, fantastic for accessibility that we've shed those header images, like not the big giant header, but like every heading on a page yeah. was an image. Yeah shed those in, in favor of having real content on the page. And that's made it so much more accessible as well. So that's just yeah. one example. But just as I think through it, as you were talking to just that tie between SEO and accessibility, I feel like there's a closer connection there than most people think about. Yeah. And honestly, I, I think that because I will be totally transparent and I don't think about all these things a lot. It was I, th this process of putting this presentation together was very cathartic for me personally to say, you know, like all the all the places that I need to be paying attention to. But the reality is, if you're doing good design, if you're doing smart development, if you're doing good SEO, you've pretty much got 99 percent of these bases covered because they all align with one another. They're all working together already. And now we're just getting rewarded for the good work by Google because they're implementing accessibility practices within rankings because um, it, it's just good for everyone. Yeah, absolutely. And you added the um, the links here to the checklist and the slides in the mm -hmm. chat. I will make sure that those get added to um, the event page when we add the replay there. And I will also include okay. those in the email that goes out with the replay so that nice. um, fo folks have those. Um, we are getting to the top of the hour. That is all the questions that I had. I don't see any more um, coming in in the chat at the moment. Um, Ken did post as well. We do have uh, in the GoDaddy Pro community for every event that we do, we have a topic so we can keep the conversation going there. Um, so Ken posted the link to that in the chat. I will make sure that that's all in all of those places I just mentioned as well. Um, and we can continue having the conversation there if people have additional questions. Um, other than that, uh, thank you all for joining us today. I have um, we have another a meetup next Wednesday called Hacking Social Media Coffee Chat, and we'll have um, a couple of folks from our GoDaddy Pro social media team come on and just talk about growing your presence on social media and and some of the tips and tricks that they've learned along the way. That'll be next Wednesday, same time, same place. Um, and to register for that or any other future events, go to events.godaddy.com. Uh, and you'll also see the past event replays there, as well as this one when it's ready. Um, that's it for us. Thank you again, Nikki. Uh, another Thank amazing you. presentation. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. And I appreciate you all being here. Yep. Well, Thanks thank so much for joining us. And uh, we'll see everyone next time. Bye-bye.